Hi, this is Coach P with MasterYourChess.com and this is the second part of the video Mind Scores. In the first video we looked at positions where the pawns were blocked and the kings were on the same side of the board as their pawn. And we've said whichever king reaches a critical square first will be able to capture the enemy pawn. If our pawn crossed the middle of the board then we will be able to get a win. And if our pawn is in our side of the board, then black would be able to get a draw if he can take the opposition when we capture his pawn. In this video, we're going to take a look at a couple of positions where one king or both kings are in the opponent's side of the board going after their pawn. In this first position, both kings are in each other's side of the board going after the opponent's pawn. And for these type of positions, the rule is this. Whichever king is able to attack the enemy pawn first on the squares that are not mined, for example for white would be the squares d7, e7, and f7, and for black would be the squares f4, e4, and d4, would be able to capture the enemy's pawn. Here, if it's white to move, white will be able to reach the critical square d7 first. Therefore, he should be able to win black's pawn. So after we move the king to d7, black will have to defend this pawn, and the only square that he can defend it on is f5. Well, this is a landmine. Therefore, white will be able to blow him off, and black will have to retreat, and after white wins the pawn, he will be able to promote his pawn to a queen and win the game. In this next position, we can see that black is in white side of the board. And if we count, we will see that it will take black one, two, three, four moves to reach the critical square c5 and attack white's pawn. And for white, it will take him one, two, three, four, five moves to attack black's pawn on the square c8. Therefore, white should play for a draw here and not go after black's pawn or he will lose this game. He just wants to make sure that when black takes his pawn on b6, he is able to take the opposition on b4. Now, there are a lot of different ways to reach the square b6, and all of these will take 6 moves. For example, he could go just straight across, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or he could even do something like zigzag, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. However, white has to be super careful here because black can use a strategy called shouldering and force a win in this game if white is not careful. For example, if white is going towards the square b4 careless, black will be able to deviate white from reaching that square. For example, let's say white moves the king to g4. Now, black will actually be able to win this game. He's going to come to c2, let's say king f4, black will come to the square d3 and now you could see that white cannot go towards that square anymore he's gonna have to move around black's king so he's gonna have to move the king to e5 black will be able to come to c4 again not letting white go towards the square b4 and then here if white moves the king to d6 then black will attack white's pawn first not stepping on a landmine and now the only way to defend his pawn white will have to step on the square c6 which is a landmine therefore black will be able to blow him off and then from here white will have to retreat and black will take the pawn and also he's going to be able to reach the critical square to ranks ahead of his pawn and he will be able to win the game and if we go back over here, if white, instead of going to d6, will take the opposition, he's still not going to be able to stop black from taking his pawn. Black will attack white's pawn on c5. White will try to come to d3. Black will take the pawn. White will come to c4. But black will be able to reach the critical square a5, two ranks in front of his pawn, and then also be able to get the opposition and promote his pawn. So what white has to do to be able to get a draw here, he has to go towards the square b4, but trying to go as furthest away from black's king as possible. So the path that he wants to follow is going towards the end of the board diagonally and then going towards the square b4. If you count, you will see that even this takes 6 moves.
one, two, three, four, five, six. So it is the same amount of moves. However, this will help white be able to take the opposition uh, and not be shouldered or pushed away by black. So let's go through the position. So here white wants to move the king to g3. Black is going to try to stop him. White will move the king to f2. Black can move to d3. Then we move the king to e1. And now if black is going after white's pawn, white will simply just be coming behind him. After he moves the king to c4, we would be able to come to c3. After he takes the pawn, we would be able to take the opposition. And from here, we know that this is a draw and black cannot do anything to stop white from getting a stalemate. Rook pawns are an exception. If you look at this position on the first glance, you might think that black is winning since he's going to be able to attack white's pawn first. For example, it's going to take him one, two, three moves to attack white's pawn, and it's going to take white four moves to attack black's pawn. However, this position is not winning for black, but it's actually winning for white. The reason why is that the rules for landmines does not apply for rook pawns. If white steps on the square b7, for example here, which is supposed to be a landmine, he will not be able to be blown up by black. The one square that black should reach to be able to blow white up is the square b6, but he cannot step on that square if white guards it on b7. And also the pawns are on the edge of the board, and black will not be able to blow him off on the other side. Therefore, the strategy here for white to win, he's going to try to push black away from attacking his pawn. For example, he's going to move the king to e6, and then black is going to try to come after the pawn. White will come with the king to d5, and now he's going to deviate black from attacking his pawn, and now white will be able to come to d6. After black attacks white's pawn first, white will be able to defend it on the square b7 and this is not a landmine anymore just because black cannot blow white up here as he's not going to be able to go outside of the board and the square b7 is taken from black so from here black can only take the opposition white will take the pawn and then move to b8 and then slowly promote his pawn to a queen coming back from the beginning if white, instead of going with the king to e6, he's going after the pawn on e7, here black will be able to get a draw. All he has to do is make sure that he's going to be able to take the horizontal out position when white takes the pawn, and now white cannot get outside of the rook file, and black is going to keep him stuck in there and get a draw. In the end, I do want to mention that the landmines are also valid for the pawns that are next to each other. So here, the landmines are also the squares f3, f5, d5, and d3. So if white is trying to attack black's pawn, let's say coming to the square d3, he will be blown up by black coming to the square e5. And now white will lose the pawn. Let's say he moves the king to d2, black takes the pawn. The only good news here is that you are going to be able to take the opposition and not allow black to come and reach the critical square, which even though it's one rank in front of the pawn, black is not going to be able to reach it, and, and therefore you will be able to get a draw. Also, going around the pawn, you're not going to be able to make any progress, and you got to be careful. For example, let's say black is just waiting, and you're trying to go around, you're going to have to be super careful because if here, let's say you move the king to f5, now you got outside of the square of the pawn. Black has a queen in three moves, and for you, it's going to take you one, two, three, four moves. And also, black is just simply going to block you, and now you will not be able to uh, stop his pawn from becoming a queen. Therefore, if we go back from the beginning, we could call this position as untouchable pawns, as nobody's going to be able to attack the pawns or win the other pawns. All we have to do is dance around and nobody's going to be able to make any progress, and this will be a draw. And in the end, the last position I want to add here in the landmines lesson is positions that involve other pawns as well. Here, why to move is actually winning. Even though before we saw uh, pawns next to each other and we said that those pawns are untouchable, right now having extra pawns makes a big difference. The winning move for white here is, believe it or not, king to d3. 
and you might be, oh my god, you just stepped in your landmine and you're gonna be blown up. Well, here, yes, black will come to the square e5 to protect the pawn and on the first glance looks like he's blowing us up. However, if we look at the pawns on the left side, you can see that white's pawn is on the original square and white has two tempi. So therefore, here, white will be able to force black and Zugswan after he's going to move the pawn to b3. Black only is able to move the pawn to b5, and now white will have the last tempo. Having an extra tempo, he's going to move to b4, blowing black up, and black will be the one that has to retreat, and we will be able to win the pawn. And unlike the other times, even though he has the opposition, now this is a fox and the chicken type of position where we will be able to win the pawn. We're simply going to push the pawn to e5. Let's say black is going to block it. We come to e4. Black moves back, and after we move the king to d5 and black takes the opposition, we're going to let the pawn go on e5 and go take the other pawn, and then take the opposition and simply push the pawn to a queen. Okay, thank you so much for watching this video. I encourage you to visit my website masterchess.com where you will be able to practice a lot of positions involving mind squares.